Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the webinar series Facing an Outbreak, Issues of Global Health, Ethics and Technology. Today, we will discuss uh, a peculiar aspect of the outbreak. Uh, I mean, the use of digital health technologies in facing uh, the pandemics and we will reason and reflect on the impact uh, uh, the use of these technologies can have on both uh, the therapeutic relationship and communication. Uh, we thank uh, our speakers uh, today, um, three colleagues uh, and uh, researchers uh, um, joined us. Monica Consolandi is uh, actually a PhD student uh, at the University Vita Salute San Raffaele, the Department of Philosophy, and she works uh, on a project uh, on communication uh, to patients and, and more generally on doctor patient uh, interaction and communication. Uh, Monica works is also affiliated at the Center of Religious Studies of the Bruno Kessler Foundation inside the PhD, FBK PhD program. And she is uh, as well a fellow of the One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida in the United States. Um, so we thank Monica for coming. Alain Lut is a uh, professor at the Center uh, for Medical Ethics of the Catholic University of Lille. Alain is a philosopher and uh, she teaches at present both philosophy but also rights and ethics of digital health that in French uh, sounds droit et éthique de la santé numérique. To talk about digital health in French, um, the words used are santé numérique. There is this uh, numeric aspect uh, underscore. Alain is a lecturer also at the Faculty of Computer Science of the University of Namur and is a scientific associate at the Center for Research Information, Law and Society of the same university. Alain has written extensively and published on hermeneutics, social philosophy, car ethics, technology ethics, and digital health. And he is a wonderful teacher, I can guarantee that. Enrico Piras is a colleague, he is a researcher at the Center for Health and Wellbeing, Digital Health and Wellbeing of the um, Bruno Kessler Foundation. He uh, holds uh, a PhD in Information Systems and Organization, and uh, his research activity focuses uh, um, most of all on health information, healthcare infrastructure, and on technology mediated uh, coordination of healthcare professionals. Enrico teaches, is adjunct professor at the University of Verona and he teaches methodology of organizational research and sociology of organizational processes. Um, so I, all of them are working uh, in a very interesting and reflexive, I think, uh, way uh, on the challenge uh, caused by the introduction of digital health technologies in, uh, in the healthcare system and in the therapeutic and caring relationships. So I thank all of them for coming. I thank also um, the Michele Nicoletti who joined us, uh, who is co-organized co-organizer of this uh, webinar series um, with the Department uh, of uh, Humanities of the University of Trento. So uh, many thanks to all of you. Here we have uh, some clinicians, uh, some philosophers uh, who joined us. And so I leave the floor to Monica for her first presentation. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and a special thanks to Lucia, of course, for having me here today. So meanwhile, I'll share my screen. Oh. 
Okay, can you confirm me to see full screen? screen? Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay, so today I'd like to bring your attention to a topic that has a central role in the clinical world, the community dimension of care. COVID-19 outbreak has highlighted this dimension from a very special perspective. Even though communication between patients and healthcare workers is always worthy of attention, COVID-19 has underlined both the essential nature of communication in the clinical world and its related problems. Because, you know, during the lockdown all around the world, hospitals and healthcare facilities... Okay. I'm sorry, I have some... Okay. <laughs> so I was saying that um, all around the world, um, hospital and healthcare facilities in general were closed to the public. So that means that families couldn't visit their beloved ones, doctors couldn't speak directly with family members to update them, on the condition of the relatives, and patients not hospitalized couldn't have a medical examination, not to speak about the terrible condition in which doctors had to communicate with hospitalized patients. So it was immediately evident that it was necessary to do something different to approach this moment that had abruptly changed the daily routine. In Italy, and um, I know that it was quite the same in other countries, we adopted new technologies to solve this new challenge. So first of all, we use tablet and platforms like WhatsApp, Skype, Skype, and similar to allow patients and families to keep in touch. We started using telemedicine, which at least in Italy is a brand new way to do medicine, at least it was, so now it's about a year that we are experiencing this new um, tool. And for what concerned the doctor families' interactions, we scheduled an approximately daily meeting between healthcare workers and patients' relatives that took place on the phone. And this last point, in my opinion, is the one that reveals that not everything goes right. But let me proceed with order. So what's happening here? There's a response to a challenge that we have never lived before. At least we can say that we're not used to it, even though history teaches us that it's not actually the first time that a pandemic spread. This time is disruptive and we have to react quickly. So we don't know how to cure the coronavirus or the world is focused on possible therapies, vaccine, effective medications. But there's a human dimension in all of this medical scenario that has not to be forgotten the relational dimension. So that expresses in the communicative one, we can say. How to preserve if, it is, if it's possible, if it's not possible to have contact with anyone. And healthcare workers can have the usual supportive role due to the emergency measures. So the answers that we have just said are new technologies, but this also finds them a function that is not only supportive, because it's more than this, as the relation is almost completely delivered to these new technologies and relies quite completely on them. Noticing this, we better understand the delicate role that new technologies are assuming in the clinical world, at least in this specific moment. So let me briefly analyze the pros and cons of these kind of mediated communications. I'll focus my, I'll focus my attention on the three forms I mentioned before, so the use of conference platforms, telemedicine, and phone calls. So first of all, the use of WhatsApp and similar program. It was very useful. Um, the idea of using this method to keep patients and families in contact started local and then began a common path in the Italian clinical context. It allowed people to be in touch beyond physical distancing, preserving the state of health of people in good health, and avoiding the spread of the virus, of course. I think there's space to improve this way of communication in the future because we need, for example, more tablets to allow everyone to speak with, with their beloved ones more than twice a week, more than 10 minutes per time. But I hope that this is the farthest step and we're working on this actually. So what are the cons? I think we all agree if I say that it's not the same to see a person we love in person rather than on a screen, of course, but it's the way possible in this extreme condition, right? 
So I believe the real cons here, it's not about the tool itself, but instead its possible consequences. Indeed, this kind of privileged way to communicate with families was reserved, and it's logical, of course, for those patients that actually could physically use tablets and tools like tablets. So those patients that due to their conditions weren't able to do that, had no way to communicate with their beloved. And again, I think that we all agree if I say that a patient lying in a bed and incapable of speech needs their beloved as, as the others in a better health state maybe even more than them. So we are intentionally increasing um, the uh, disparities. Uh, actually, these technology as are intentionally decreasing, increasing this kind of uh, disparities, and we have to pay attention to this. Um, it's more a problem, of course, um, and the solution is not, not to use this kind of tool with patients that, um, that can, but be aware that an indispensable further step is to find a way also for those patients that cannot use this kind of uh, um, tools uh, to be sure to include them. Too. Then telemedicine, that is very fascinating to me. Um, at the first sight, it may seem to encourage the opposite of, for, of a solid doctor-patient relationship because there's no physical contact, there's no examination, there's not even a shared place, and everything is um, virtual. And these, of course, are the cons of telemedicine. I disagree with the perspective that says telemedicine is the whole future of medicine. Even if we admit more developed tools, maybe an interactive augmented reality system, I don't think that I'll never agree with the absence of human contact free, I mean, of any technological mediation. But however, telemedicine has its pros, of course. I sum you up the pros of telemedicine in our physiatrist stories that I'm going to read. I translated it from Italian, but it's quite uh, rigorous. So. He said, I had a follow up with this woman I had been caring for for years. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we couldn't see in person, but she had a condition that had to be periodically checked. She was wearing an orthopedic corset and I had to decide for how long. So we scheduled the follow up on Skype and I found her very well. I decided that it was the moment to take it off. And something unusual for me happens. She started crying. She was so happy and touched by that she started crying. And in over 30 years, I can say, of my, of my profession, it was the first time that I see a patient crying because I told her to take off the orthopedic brace. And I have my personal answer to that. She was at home, and I was at home with her, even if virtually. She was comfortable in her living room and relaxed. End of quote. So the physiatrist is telling us something that in my opinion is quite surprising. Despite appearances, telemedicine could create a framework that is more human than the face-to-face -face encounter between doctor and patient. Because it allows doctor to enter the patient home, even virtually. So the patient is at home and at the same time, the doctor is not there and at the contrary of home visits. So this method of communication is also effective as it means fewer costs and less time invested. It's not always the best choice. As I said before, the human interaction has to be, to be preserved as the basis of the doctor-patient relationship. And besides, from a clinical point of view, it's impossible to conduct a medical examination, as I already uh, pointed out, through a screen with the tools that we currently have, at least. So telemedicine has for now to be confined to specific cases like this follow-up um, the follow-up of the previous example. Last but not least, phone calls between clinicians and patients' relatives. So the first consideration that came to my mind when I learned about this method of communication was why did they choose this? Because all of us know that we have more advanced tools to communicate and we have just seen their application in the clinical context, so um, tools like um, uh, tablets, platforms like Skype and uh, telemedicine. So why they choose the less developed? The answer is simple, actually. It's time, 
We know that time represents a topic itself in the clinical world because it's a problem. <laughs> There's always a sense of hurry in the clinical setting and it reflects on communicative spaces too. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, time was even less than usual. There were so many patients to, to take care of. Um, that time was always narrow and healthcare workers worked lots of their time to provide for this. So it's crystal clear that a phone call is quicker than a conference call. Besides, it's more inclusive as a phone call in 2020 could reach almost everyone while a conference call is still a privilege even if widespread. And it allowed to avoid the visual impact of a doctor covering DPI. The second consideration about this way of communication that came to my mind was how could doctors tell a son that his mother died on the phone, a wife that her husband is in severe condition. So I thought that this pandemic took from us an essential part of the communication, the one that in philosophy of language is called pragmatics. Pragmatics is body language, facial expressions, jokes, uh, rhetoric. Uh, pragmatics is all that in communication so it's said that on the phone, the pragmatics is reduced near zero. And in Italy, indeed, a bunch of associations has drawn up a guidance to support healthcare workers in this new challenge. Here's a couple of examples from their position paper. They suggest, for example, using the word death with families not to be misunderstandable. And the result, you see, it's a more direct and straight to the point way of expression. So they suggest avoiding ambiguous phrase. For example, your dad is no longer with us um, to say that um, the patient's father is dead because the daughter could understand that her dad has been moved to another unit, for example. And all of these examples show us that the pragmatic side of communication has to be replaced by a concise crystal are clear things, the simple sentences, simple words, and simple concepts. So it seems that there's a big difference between phone calls and conference calls, right? Because the pragmatics is almost completely absent only during a phone call. However, it seems to me that this difference between these two ways of communication is actually a sign of a common problem between all of these tools we just analyzed. And it's indeed the lack of pragmatic side of communication. So it's true that on a conference call, we can see the other person, their gesture. We can probably understand if they're joking, that at least it's less, I mean, it's more difficult on the phone. But at the same time, who have never experienced some difficulties when speaking on a webcam? Because you know that there's no eye contact, for example. So we don't really see each other in the eyes. The body language is partial, as most time we can only see the upper body and not always the hands, for example. Uh, we can joke and be ironic, but it's not always so easy to be understood because space, the space is not shared by the speakers and this makes everything more difficult than a face-to-face -face experience. So, all of this makes me think that the use of technological tools during the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of communication in the clinical world with a specific focus on the pragmatic side of communication. This means that we can learn two lessons from these emergency circumstances, at least two lessons in this context. First, we, know, we now know that technological tools can be really helpful by taking a few precautions and it's something that, in my opinion, is worth it to last even the, you know, after this outbreak will be ended. So we can see, we have to see, I suggest to see new technologies as a resource. And second, healthcare workers and communicators before being good technology users. And I'm not saying here that they are not, because thanks to their experience in their field, they can build their own strategies to communicate their messages to patients and their families. However, I strongly believe that it's necessary to provide them the knowledge that we already have on this subject. So teaching communication to healthcare workers means to make them um, stronger, I would say more confident in communicating information and news to patients and their families, 
and to give them a solid basis to be expanded with their own opinion, uh, or um, with their own experience i'm sorry so not just built from scratch it means giving them the right tools to be able to control semantics and pragmatics too so the step forward in my opinion is to be confident enough to be able to control even a situation of emergency in which has happened during COVID-19 lockdown, there's no pragmatics. This will, have, this will help them in preventing a huge amount of stress and patients and their families in being well supported by default, we could say. So the use of new technologies makes healthcare workers deal with the problematic of a weird communication. This is not avoidable but giving them the right tools to communicate properly in advance will at least make it easier for both the parts in dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for this uh, first uh, reflection on, on validity and limits uh, of these technologies. And thank you for your very, very sharp focus on what we need and what could be improved. So now I leave the floor to Alain Lut for his uh, presentation and intervention. Thank you, Alain. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, I really thank you for the invitation. Thank you to all the organizers. I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, here and to discuss uh, on uh, those topic of digital health and, and, and COVID. I will share my screen. Oops, here it is. Uh, yes. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Thank you. So the title of my um, presentation is Experimenting Technology During the Crisis, the COVID Crisis. So my point of departure is the fact that um, COVID crisis um, has not been only a medical one, as, uh, an economical one, uh, a social one, but it has all, uh, also be, um, been an uh, epistemic uh, crisis. Uh, as the historian Lorraine Danston, with um, the COVID crisis, uh, I quote her, we have been suddenly been catapulted back to the 17th century. She was not, of course, referring to the plague. She was more referring to uh, the state of the early uh, modern uh, science, um, a period of, I quote her, of ground zero empiricism, in which almost everything is up for grasp. Um, a period of deep uncertainty. Uncertainty not only about phenomenon, but also about methodology, how to produce knowledge. Habermas, the same day, it's uh, interesting, in uh, the newspaper Le Monde, uh, said that never before has so much been known about what we don't know. So in this context of uncertainty, digital technologies have been used to produce knowledge. Um, digital technologies have been used for producing um, epidemi epidemiological modeling, epidemiological monitoring of population, uh, etc. As the um, philosophy of uh, science Bernadette Bensaud Vincent wrote, the coronavirus creates not only a mondial crisis, but it has transformed the world into a laboratory. In a way, cell phone and smartphone has become an uh, instrument of knowledge. For instance, uh, the operator Orange in France has shared anonymized location data with uh, the INSERM, the National Institute of Health and Medical Research. Um, uh, Orange has shared uh, data to enable epidemiologists to model the spread of the disease. My point is the fact that uh, digital technologies were not only tools instrument for knowledge, not only simply tools for experimentation. Um, uh, I think, and it will be my main hypothesis uh, in this presentation, my uh, hypothesis is the crisis was also an opportunity to experiment these uh, technologies at large scale. 
technologies not only for experimenting, but experimenting technology um, in this period. I would like to, I propose, I suggest to consider telemedicine because uh, among um, different digital technologies, I will focus on telemedicine. I suggest then to consider telemedicine in the crisis as experimentation at scale society. Why? Three justification uh, for this hypothesis. First, a methodological one. I think that de facto telemedicine has been um, experimented at scale society because the crisis has caused technology to move very quickly from controlled and localized experimentation to generalized experimentation throughout society. Um, before the crisis, a lot of technologies like certain devices of telemedicine were still experimented at, in a control um, and, and in a control environment. But with Alain, the crisis, Alain, yes? excuse oui? me if I interrupt you. We yeah, see sure. the first slide, but ah. uh, not uh, it's, uh, the presentation is not uh, moving on. Okay. Thank you for telling me. Maybe you. if you don't mind, I could let it uh, that way. Is it fine now for you? Now we can see. Yes, now it's uh, perfect. Larger. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. So my hypothesis was uh, that um, the opportunity was also the the crisis was also the opportunity to experiment technology, and then I I I, I would like to consider technology and um, specific and especially uh, telemedicine uh, like uh, I consider telemedicine as experimentation at scale society. So I present the first um, justification explanation of this hypothesis, which was a methodological one. The second one is an epistemological one because these technologies and um, telemedicine device have been used without full knowledge of their full effectiveness and side effects. So then um, we experiment, we have experimented telemedicine um, because we, we didn't know all the side effects of uh, all technologies uh, which were used. And third, I would like to consider, I justify the, 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 the fact of considering telemedicine as experimentation at scale society uh, from a normative, point of view, because the concept of experimentation as a normative dimension of, or I, I could say that uh, the concept of experimentation uh, open normative um, um, issues. Um, uh, actually, the way in which the experimentation, the experimentation of technologies has been carried out is an indicator of all health democracy. I will explain uh, why um, I, I, I say that. So um, it's the hypothesis I would like to, to develop. Um, we have to consider telemedicine during the crisis as an experiment at scale society. Uh, three sections um, of my presentation. First, uh, I will present um, the legal framework of telemedicine in France. Um, I will focus only in the France, uh, um, above all in the France uh, context. Second point, I will present the derogatory framework of telemedicine during the crisis. Uh, public authority have uh, produced uh, a derogatory framework for facilitating the spread and the generalization of telemedicine during the crisis. I will present uh, that framework in the second point. And third and finally, um, I will uh, develop the thesis um, of uh, considering telemedicine as a large scale experiment. But first, let's begin by presenting the legal framework of telemedicine in France. First, telemedicine, um, for instance, if we look at the WHO uh, definition of 2010, is defined uh, as um, caring by distance. Uh, um, I quote, the delivery of healthcare service where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies. And 
the quotes um, continues, uh, in defining the very different kind of use uh, of uh, um, communication technology that could be for exchanging uh, valid information for dia diagnosis, but for treatment, uh, also for prevention of disease and injuries, but also for research and evaluation, and for the continuing ed education of healthcare providers. That's uh, the definition of the WHO. In France, um, the definition of telemedicine is um, more precise. And another peculiarities of France, um, uh, the peculiarity of France is the fact that uh, telemedicine is recognized, uh, is established um, from a legal basis. Um, the first uh, legal recognition of telemedicine is through the law uh, known as the HPST law in 2009 and uh, its decree of um, 2010 who precise um, the five possible acts of telemedicine, teleconsultation, teleexpertise, Téléassistance, télésurveillance, and the uh, regulation uh, medical. But what we have, uh, we have to focus on the fact that for France, telemedicine is an act, a medical act. So it's a, let's say, a narrow definition of telemedicine. Telemedicine in France, it's only medical act. So in France, uh, public authority have um, distinguished telemedicine from e-health, for instance. E-health, which is a more broad uh, area, um, which concern, let's say, ICT for health. Um, ICT like uh, system d'information, um, medical, um, digitalized uh, files, uh, etc. But so telemedicine are medical acts. So that means that they have to respect uh, the rules of every medical act, um, for instance, they have to respect the deological, deontological code of conduct. Another law important um, for teleconsultation is um, the law uh, in 2018, um, which precise and we adds uh, other condition for the realization of teleconsultation, um, if teleconsultation uh, could be uh, reimbursed by the assurance maladie. Um, and um, those conditions are, for instance, the fact that teleconsultation covered by health insurance uh, can only be carried out by an attending physician on its or her own initiative and with is or her patients. Another uh, strong condition for realizing teleconsultation is the fact that teleconsultation cannot be offered as a primary consultation. The primary consultation has to be done uh, presential. And um, other important uh, condition is the fact that teleconsultation must be alternate with face-to-face -face consultation. So, here is, in a few words, the uh, legal, the regulatory framework of telemedicine and especially teleconsultation in France. With the crisis, things have changes. Change. Um, first, um, uh, let's note the fact that telemedicine has been promoted by WHO and other charities uh, as a mean to struggle with the, with the crisis, um, a mean to avoid bringing potentially infected citizens to the doctor's office, but also to ensure continuity of care, which was and is it's still a very important challenge. As the literature, uh, as the state of literature has shown, um, it's important because uh, uh, there is not only coronavirus who kill, to, to quote and translate um, that um, sentence uh, from um, physicians. Um, the, the, the fact of not continuing care could also kill, literally kill uh, people. So telemedicine was presented and promoted as a solution for those two uh, challenges, how to continue care 
uh, with infected, infected citizens and with other citizens um, who, are, uh, uh, who, are, who are at home. Then, uh, faced with the crisis, the French authorities have taken measures to temporarily derogate from uh, the framework of telemedicine to facilitate continuity of care. And it is the decree of March 9 uh, in 2020. Among derogation, let's point the fact that a first face-to-face -face consultation is no longer necessary to obtain reimbursement uh, for the act. Another derogation is that teleconsultation can be carried out by any technological means to achieve a video transmission. This point is very important for us, our topic today. Um, and then this uh, derogatory framework has helped to increase the number of medical acts. And the French health insurance system um, has shown uh, that th there were um, a, a real increase of um, act of telemedicine. There were more than 1 million act of telemedicine in early April 2020. Third and final section of my presentation, I would like then to develop my hypothesis, which is that then telemedicine during the crisis could be considered like a large scale experiment. Why, uh, why I say that? Three explanation of this hypothesis. First is the fact that de facto, um, a lot of technologies have been um, used as a society-wide experiment and before the crisis, they were still used and experimented uh, in a controlled environment. For explaining that, uh, we have to say a word about the methodology of experiment. The methodology of experiment is a method which is more and more promoted by the public authorities because it, uh, uh, public authorities consider that experiment is a new innovative method uh, that could allow, um, that would accompany uh, innovation. It's a method uh, which could help innovation. And I quote and read the definition of experimentation following the Conseil d'État. Um, Conseil d'État uh, defined experimentation, I quote, as a method that allows a measure, a policy, a mode of organization or a new technology to be tested in the field for a limited period of time and to measure its effect objectively. Experimentation is a tool for innovative and effective public policies, which allow citizens to be involved in their development. Its purpose is to inform the choices of public decision makers. Another thing important, important to say is that um, uh, experimentation is not only a method, it's a right, a right uh, in France. The right to experimentation has been enshrined in the constitution since 2003 under article 37.1. And in the field of health policy, um, a lot of experimental um, experimentation has been developed to test uh, in a very uh, uh, controlled context and for a limited period of time. A lot of uh, experience uh, have been uh, developed to test it uh, and then after to generalize it if the, if the effectiveness and the interest of uh, the innovation has been proved. And so the methodology of experimentation has been used a lot for promoting and uh, developing um, telemedicine. Um, teleconsultation before uh, being reimbursed uh, by the Assurance Maladie National Health Insurance in 2018, teleconsultation have been experiment uh, from a regional scale um, through the authority of the IRS, les agences régionales de santé. Um, so they have been experimented. Uh, and then only after uh, an exper experiment of a few years, they have been generalized. 
now there is still experimentation that are developed, uh, for, a, for example, um, within the program ETAP on the right of the slide, which is um, a program, um, a telemedicine uh, experimentation program for the improvement of healthcare paths. And the purpose of the program is to experiment uh, telemonitoring uh, projects and devices. So de facto, um, uh, the, the crisis um, through the derogatory framework, which has facilitated uh, and promoted uh, the generalization of teleconsultation, um, we have been from a controlled um, experimentation of telemedicine um, to a large scale uh, experimentation of uh, technology. It's also the case of uh, trace, tracing app. Um, um, uh, so um, uh, it's uh, something that the Comité National Pilote d'Ethique du Numérique, um, has, has, uh, it's something uh, on which the Comité National Pilote d'Ethique du Numérique uh, has been developed some reflection, um, is the fact that um, there is a risk for this ethical committee for to, to, to quickly use um, tracing app at large scale after a too short um, experimentation of those app at a local level. Um, the risk is to uh, experiment it, uh, those tracing app uh, in a control environment, um, in a sandbox, uh, for borrowing the word uh, uh, of um, uh, Cédric Villani in his report, um, the risk is to, uh, to quickly generalize um, this uh, up to the whole society um, without deep guarantee of the effectiveness uh, and the, 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 the no existence of side effect of those um, um, tracing uh, up. So it's uh, first explanation of the idea of considering telemedicine and digital health technology as an experimentation uh, at large scale is the fact that with the crisis, maybe we have more quickly than before, uh, um, uh, we, we, we have been using those technology, um, not only in control experimental uh, situation, but in uh, societies at scale. The other justification of considering uh, telemedicine during the crisis at large scale experiment is the fact that um, technology that have been used, uh, uh, they have been used without full knowledge of their effectiveness and side effect. Um, for example, for the um, uh, Belgian Health Care Knowledge Center report, um, teleconsultation is still being evaluated uh, on a scientific uh, level. For the authors of the uh, report, um, uh, which have conducted a systematic review of uh, medical liter literature on teleconsultation, there is no robust evidence or, of equivalent of or superiority to face-to-face -face consultations, nor of any negative effect on patients who seem to be satisfied with it." End of quote. So um, uh, um, telemedicine, uh, we use it in an experimental way because we, we, we didn't know um, exactly uh, uh, what could be the side effects of uh, telemedicine. Telemedicine and teleconsultation, it's still being evaluated. Um, and to well understood, to well understand that, we have to have in mind the fact that the decree, the French decree of uh, March 9 uh, uh, authorizes, authorized uh, professional by way of der derogation to consult remotely uh, via digital communication tool from the, for the general public if they don't have the necessary equipment to use referenced and secure device. So the decree authorizes a physician to use a phone, uh, for instance. Um, and this derogation has been uh, uh, until uh, June 2021, I think. So uh, we don't know uh, the consequences of using quick and dirty digital, uh, borrowing the words of Antonio uh, Casilli. 
And uh, also, we don't know what were the consequences during the crisis, but what will be in the future the consequences of using quick and dirty um, digitals um, in uh, tele uh, consultation. Let me quote uh, that, uh, that quotation um, in an article uh, devoted to ethics of digital mental health during uh, COVID. Um, uh, the author said that uh, in the US, the Food and Drug Administration relaxed regulation of mental health hub uh, for depression, anxiety, and insomnia, uh, etc. So same uh, uh, same process than in France, a process of uh, um, uh, relaxed regula relaxing regu regulation um, for uh, promoting uh, using of uh, digital health uh, technology. But uh, the consequences uh, could be that Lowering standards may lead to efficiency in the short term, okay, but the widespread adoption of locality technology during the pandemics could lead to a long term substandard tier of, of service. Um, it's why, for the uh, Comité Consultatif National d'Ethique in France, we have to uh, ask ourselves now uh, what could be uh, the consequences. Uh, in the future of the generalization of uh, those innovation. Other question uh, is uh, what are the social consequences of this use of uh, telemedicine? Um, we think about the digital divide, etc. Um, uh, is telemedicine a way to solve the problem of the digital or a way of increasing, deepening uh, the digital divide? Um, another um, the, uh, very important question is the question of spatiality. I'm referring here to uh, the work of Nelly Otsoron, for instance, but many other authors have uh, faced and raised uh, that question. We have discovered that um, all space are not equal. Um, we are not living in um, space which are the same. Um, it's not the same to have a teleconsultation with someone who is living uh, with 10 people uh, in a very small apartment or with someone who is living in a house uh, where he could isolate himself um, uh, in a room, um, etc. So that was the, the second reason of considering telemedicine during the crisis as a large scale experiment is the fact that we don't know what were the consequences of those um, extremely widespread uh, of telemedicine, um, we, we didn't know the consequences and, uh, of, of the, the, the use, and we don't know the future consequences and side effect of uh, this uh, um, generalization of telemedicine. And the, the final justification of considering telemedicine during the crisis uh, as large scale experiment is a normative one. Considering telemedicine as an experimentation is a way of questioning um, its governance, questioning the governance of telemedicine experimentation. I really think that it's not only a methodological and an epistemological uh, question, but also um, ethical and political questions. Um, a lot of articles and authors um, have reminded that I quote Jean-Briel Ganaskia, the ethics of experimentation, especially human experimentations, remains an imperative no matter what happens, even in a health crisis. But what about ethics of experimenting technologies? Not only ethics of experimentation in the classical clinical research, but what about ethic of experimenting, experimenting technology? Is the population only the object of the experiments or the population could not be um, something like a co-investigator? Um, that's a real ethical and political uh, question. And I uh, finish with that quote of Barbara Stiegler, who said that the world of health seems to be torn between two incompatible conceptions of democracy. The first, in the line with the Lipman model of expert government, reinforced the dichotomy between an experimentation conduct from above the expert and the target of this experimentation, uh, a population reduced to, uh, to consent and to socially acceptability of innovations. The other, much closer to the participatory democracy theorized by 
Dewey, John Dewey, intends to reinterpret health democracy, democracy sanitaire in, in France, as an opportunity for active participation of the public in the experimentation. Thank you for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Alain, for this thoughtful reflection and for your beautiful contribution. Now I leave the floor to Enrico Miras, who will who is the discussant for for uh, for this uh, uh, for the two presentation we have uh, uh, listened to. Thank you, Enrico. Thanks to you for having me here and uh, for organizing the seminar. I get notification from the system that my connection is poor, so I don't I don't know if you see my face, uh, but sometimes the connection drops, and uh, I apologize for any inconvenience in this. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, um, I want to thank the, the yeah. I've already thanked the, the Center for Religious Studies for inviting me here and for organizing the seminar. And I want to thank the, uh, the speakers because they gave two fantastic presentations and it's really uh, fascinating and you know, it's a great opportunity to discuss their work. And um, well, when they started speaking, I was thinking about that this is a great opportunity, the pandemic, and um, has given a great opportunity to us, I think. And I mean, but to us, I mean, to people who are uh, in our field, social studies, social stu sorry, social sciences, because it's uh, all the debate that is going on and that it's been uh, somehow represented also by Ellen and Monica, but they will discuss it if they agree with me. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, interesting to see that um, the opportunity that we have as a professional group, as an academic group, is that uh, we, the, all the discussion is moving away, is sort of decentralizing the, the discourse on telemedicine and telehealth from the technical perspective societal uh, the societal consequences if I can use a, a phrase used by Alain and phrase it a bit uh, both the discussion about the, the presentation deal with uh, with this to me what are the social the societal professional effects of a widespread use of telemedicine and what it's interesting in, in my opinion is that uh, all the discussion we're having does not deal with the, the technology itself. Uh, the reason why we had the possibility to use uh, uh, all these technologies in the first place, uh, as soon as the, as the pandemic um, outbreak outbreak, it was uh, mainly possible because we already had the technologies. The technologies were already there, and this is my first. Uh, I apologize with Monica. I have to. I want to problem uh, to problematize two concepts, and I want to. I bring. The first problem that I have with Monica. Uh, can we call those technologies new technologies? Why do you use this uh, concept of you, you call the WhatsApp or Skype or telemedicine new technologies? Where they were sort of old, they were kind of old technology. I'll be back to this. But the reason I think the, the, the thing that I find fascinating here is that we have the technologies at our disposal. What we missed was something else. And I think Monica. Uh, uh, did a fantastic job in, in uh, showing that what we miss is the pragmatic of communication. I've really appreciated the, the, um, the, the slide where you presented the guidelines about how to speak about that. The words used when you use a certain form of communication. The technologies were there, but the professionals, uh, as you've shown, don't know how to use that particular, that particular tool, which is kind of interesting. It's not about the technology. Again, it's about how the professional need to rearrange their skills. As you said in the last slide, we need to have great communicators, but we also need to have not just good communicators, we need communicators that are able to, dis to deal with these new technologies, which is something that, of course, they miss. It's not just because they lack personal skills, but they, they lack guidelines that, which have not been developed uh, so far. And so, as, uh, as to put it in LM word, in LM's word, this is an ongoing experiment to build uh, also those guidelines to make sure that professional can use efficiently the, the, those tools. As I was saying before, uh, we're decentralizing the role of technology and moving away from technocentrism, but also democratizing the discourse of ICT in healthcare, moving to the societal consequences. And uh, moving to, to Alain's paper, I have uh, I've said that I don't, uh, I, I, I just want to go back to to Monica discussing why she called those technologies new technologies. The, the, um, the, the problem I had with your uh, conceptualization 
is the use of um, large scale. What do you mean by large scale? Because I think uh, it, it, it resonates very well with what I've seen. But also, I think that we have also we are also witnessing something new in a way. Uh, we're also seeing some form of uh, anarchic experimentation. We have a large scale top down from like a WHO or a national regulation level that are pushing telemedicine. But if I and I apologize for this, but if I bring my own personal experience in the province of Trento in the last couple in the last year, what we have seen here is that at the department level, at hospital level, but also department level like oncology or um, cardiology, they start um, their, their own personal uh, experimentation. So we have those, uh, I wrote something here and I've called it an archive experiment or maybe swarm experiment, like swarm like flies or insects, you know, they fly in swarms. Everyone, every insect moves in a certain direction. They all move together in a certain way, but they are all different individuals. And what I have seen, both in my personal experience in my research here, but also in the literature, is that there are a lot of ongoing experiments that have been sort of, uh, you know, they, 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 they could have started years ago, but they now all th those people are at those departments are able to to push them considering they're taking the opportunity to do something that they wanted to do uh from a long time ago so i just um these are the the, the the first comments that come to my mind uh, as a reaction to your presentations so maybe it's if Lucia, if lucia agrees i'll i'll give the word back to you or to lucia to, to discuss further I, I think it would be nice to to let uh, Monica and Alain uh, answer and reply to you. So, yeah, if I need to. So, Enrico, first of all, thank you for your question that allowed me to clarify why I, I use this term. That actually is, is misleading, so you're right. And I lost some words of your uh, speech, but I hope to, I, I, I mean, I, I think I got the point. So. Um, so yeah, it's misleading because uh, the fact that I uh, spoke just only about these kind of technologies and not mainly about these technologies uh, would have me allowed to just uh, talk about technologies in general. Um, when I first chose this term, it was for two reasons, mainly because um, what I want to stress it was the difference between uh, uh, the technologies from the third revol industrial revolution and the fourth. So I was um, trying to focus the attention on these, <laughs> again, new technologies of networks and, uh, um, yeah, very new for us too, even if are uh, not new uh, in, in our contemporary world. So. Um, I did not specify this in, in my in my talk, so you're right. It's kind of uh, even useless um, in this uh, context. And the second reason is uh, that um, these technologies are qu quite new in the clinical context. So maybe what I have to uh, say is that are new in the clinical context technologies. And again, I use this this objective to distinguish the uh, technologies that are already implied in the clinical world um, and that represent a, a technological and uh, evolution even if in terms uh, of knowledge so that um, these technologies, the, the kind of technologies that allowed the uh, medical world to be more, um, to be highly specialized, and these new technologies that are related to the um, commun communicative dimension. So, uh, the, yeah, that was my intention, but you are absolutely right, this was misleading. So, I hope to uh, have clarified it. Um, thank you so much, Enrico. Your, all your remarks were very, very interesting and very relevant. First, I totally agree uh, with you, with the idea that uh, and the focus you put on the fact that technology were already there. So we, we were not speaking 
uh, neither Monica, neither me, out very disruptive technology as, for instance, artificial intelligence um, decision ma making system or etc. who could raise very um, disruptive. Um, um, so it's it's something that are quite well known. Um, Telemedicine could be made by phone. Uh, I mean, so the, it's 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 not about um, the innovation of technology um, itself. And for uh, other uh, historian or authors that I uh, that I have read, they uh, even say that for telemedicine. For instance, I heard uh, an historian uh, on on the radio during the crisis who said, "But you know." Uh, I know um, telemedicine that were they, they were already telemedicine uh, um, 100 years ago and uh, physician wrote letters etc so it's not the fact of caring by distance which is uh, really no it's it's not only the technology but it's more the fact that technology like telemedicine has been used uh, uh, it's more about politics of technology. The, the, um, telemedicine has been used as a mean for struggling the crisis, as a political mean, as a public policy tool. Uh, that's for me, that's the big difference. And um, for instance, I really like the work of an economist, a French economist, Amandine Rolly, who say that uh, the fact that what is really new with the law of 2009, the HCPST law, who recognize um, from a juridical point of view um, the telemedicine, is, is not the fact that there were no telemedicine before, but it's the fact that until that moment, telemedicine become a tool for public policy. Um, it, telemedicine become a tool for um, uh, achieving uh, public policy goal. Um, and um, from 2011, I think in France, uh, the development of telemedicine has been accompanied by um, national uh, strategy plan with national priorities, promoting technology uh, for avoiding uh, medical desert, for instance, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's more about politics of technology than uh, really technology itself. So. The, the, the uh, another very in, uh, interesting remarks uh, you um, something very interesting you say it, it was about your skepticism about the idea of large scale experiment and and that's true because um, um, uh, maybe um, it it has to be more complexified because large scale experiment is, is in a way not a very good concept because because it could um, um, induce the idea that that was something um, imposed from um, national from from the top uh, in a very homogeneous way and um, but that's not the case because um, effectively um, the the covid crisis uh, has also be the occasion of real intensive um, local innovation uh, at the micro level, but also at the meso level. Um, 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 institution, hospital um, uh, have been in innovate. They, they produce new uh, intensive room. They, they, so there were a real uh, strong innovation, but Maybe um, uh, 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 maybe it, it was we, we have witnesses something very strange which was um, a mix between um, a, 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 a very directive governance um, in a logic of planification, but at the same times um, uh, local innovation, local initiative. So it was a mix of. Um, a kind of um, planification with a kind of laisser faire or laisser innover or faire faire or something like that. So my intuition is that through experimentation, to say it in a Foucauldian way, there is something like a new mode of governmentality, which uh, rearticulate and mixed top-down governance with local innovation and promoting of local innovation, etc., uh, etc. Uh, et so. It, it, but you're totally true. Um, say large scale uh, experimentation is not a good one. Uh, another um, concept I really like, uh, um, 
but it's uh, in French. It's from Michel Lusso, which is a, a geographer. And he, in, he speak about in French multi, um, in perspective multiscalaire, to take into account the, 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 the different level of spatiality while articulating. And I think in the crisis, we have seen a, 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 a very original articulation of those uh, level of spatiality. We have, I, I've read some article who say that, oh, but now with the crisis is the perfect arti articulation of what Foucault said, anatomopolitic and biopolitic. <laughs> so uh, a way of uh, exercing the power on the body and a way of exercising uh, as a machine and a way of exercising the body as a population. But uh, it, 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 we have to define how those levels are articulated. So it's, it's really opening a, um, a field of reflection. Uh, so but thank you for, for your reflection. And maybe a, a last reaction, because you said that the thing was really about uh, you, you were um, um, reacting to uh, Monica's um, presentation, and, and you said that the, the thing is really about how the professional use technology. Um, and you said that it was not only skills, but um, there also um, uh, lack. It, it, there were a lack of guidelines, and it's interesting. But at the same time, I'm a bit skeptical about the possibility of producing. Um, in a formal way, guidelines for using technology in very different contexts. So um, maybe because at the same time we've been, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, maybe we have been overwhelmed by the situation. I always think uh, last year when I was listening to to the situation and to the data that we were notified of. I think I, I thought of this main beautiful image of, Akira, of um, Hokusai, of the Japanese painter, this idea of the great wave. And I think the effect of the pandemics has been this one, the idea of something that for many aspects overwhelmed all of us. And I think we are still adjusting to see which kind of impact the long part or the uh, the return of the wave can have, like to say. And, uh, and, and I think, uh, so for some aspects, we need, uh, as uh, all of you told, uh, we need uh, indications, so we need guidelines. Uh, but as you told at the beginning, uh, Alain, I think uh, there is something uh, um, the world is an open lab. I have this impression uh, stronger and stronger um, and more and more because for some aspects also in terms of digitalization of digital health, we can observe is not only something that regards our context that were already used to this kind of, uh, they started to use this kind uh, of technologies and to adopt them. But if we look uh, on a global scale, and that's also the reason, because we, we thought of uh, putting the, the, some issues in a global dimension, um, we can see that this kind of change has uh, happened suddenly in contexts that were much less used to, um, um, to, to digital health and digital technologies or also the digitalization in education as uh, main differences if we observe different uh, areas of the planet and of the world. So I think we need something, but the effects uh, should be well understood also should be measured because we, we are still in a process. Uh, yesterday, Enrico told uh, we cannot have uh, already results uh, coming from the research that we uh, could also uh, start during the pandemics because we are still uh, looking at what is happening, what does it mean, which kind of uh, answers we can offer and with which kind of intervention we can think of, because clearly this remains means uh, intended to try to solve the matter, to support the patients, to treat them, but then the main matter to say, could we treat them pertinently? So remains an open matter for, for medicine and in terms of clinical and, and public health intervention. So I think uh, 
So I, I, th there are a lot of open issues. So now I stop my intervention and I, I ask to participants if they have questions, please you can intervene or raise your hand uh, through the platform. That's also an option. So please, Carla Danani. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, this uh, discussion and for this uh, uh, afternoon. And I ask me and ask you <laughs> if uh, uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, is uh, pushing uh, towards, uh, uh, we can say, an idea of medicine uh, which uh, deals uh, more with data uh, than uh, with bodies uh, with live, we can say. And uh, uh, this, mean, this could mean uh, an abandonment of uh, an uh, idea of medicine as a clinical work. But uh, I ask if uh, 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 all is going, is running in this direction, what it, uh, um, uh, perhaps this change is changing our idea about health. Because uh, if um, data, medicine and health are all together, I think, uh, uh, in, in inter, uh, interconnected, and uh, we, I think that we are running towards this direction without uh, really a, a, an awareness about what is happening to the meaning of health at the end, but also about the meaning of medicine from an epistemological point of view. Thank you for your opinion about this. Okay, we would have a second question. Should we collect uh, both of, uh, maybe, okay, Michele Cardinali, please, who raise his hand, and thank you, Carla, for Okay, your thank you very much for your uh, intervention. And uh, I have a question, um, uh, not also for Alan Lut, uh, but uh, not only for uh, Alan Lut, but also for Monica Consolandi. And uh, in the future, which is the skill uh, will the, the doctor have in the, in the future? And uh, um, above all, uh, which skill is important for to communicate with, uh, with the patient? And uh, another question that, uh, that I think is um, according to your, uh, your study, according um, to your, uh, uh, your study, is there a loss of, um, of attention by the physician, by, by the doctor, between the relation uh, with, the, with the doctor? Uh, there is a, a loss of attention in the teleconsulting, the telemedicine uh, consultation. Uh, there is uh, this question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, all your question. Very, very interesting, very, very challenging. Um, maybe one first reaction um, to uh, Michele's uh, question. Um, uh, it, I think it's important to, to distinguish be between digital health as a discourse, as discourses, and digital health as technologies. Why? Why I say that? It is because technology, digital health has been really promoted by um, national authorities, um, institution, etc. Um, and so they really produce a concept of digital health, of e-health. Um, you could find in literature, in um, institutional reports, very broad, uh, explicitly and intentionally, 
intentionally very broad concept of e-health. It's really the case of my country in Belgium, where um, they um, uh, they they um, they have the, they keep the definition of e-health of the professor Eisenbach, which is a very very broad concept of e-health. E-health is not only um, caring, curing by uh, the mediation of technical and of, um, of, of ICT. It is also um, a new economy. It is also a new way of organization. So it's very, very big. Um, and so um, uh, it, it's like if they were, they really wanted to, 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 to promote the idea of a change of a paradigm. Uh, but if uh, we are, uh, uh, raising uh, more specific question like yours, which are okay, but with uh, what will will be uh, the, the 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 change for uh, physician for actors? Uh, what will be the expected change, etc.? Then I would say that it really depends of which kind of technology uh, you you are speaking about. Are you speaking about um, speaking of digital health of telemedicine? of our artificial intelligence or of uh, health data hub used for producing a big public common database, etc. So I would say that it really depends of what we are talking about. Um, and there is um, some uh, part of the e-health um, uh, which is already uh, been developed, but other parts of the, the e-health and digital health uh, discourse are still promises, promises, um, promises in the sense of the sociology of innovation, the idea that for promoting the development of technology, actors also produce discourse and promises, uh, prophecy, etc. So, so yeah, it, it, it's to answer uh, to your question, it, we, we would um, answer um, uh, uh, considering uh, each specific area of digital health, I would say. Um, and um, answering to uh, Carla um, uh, comments, and, and, and um, I would say that maybe the question will not be uh, uh, medicine will be changed, but maybe we will uh, be facing new kind of hybridation, hybridation, maybe um, uh, now physician will be more and more also researcher at the same time. Um, maybe the front, the border between um, the clinics and uh, the research will 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 blur a bit, or um, uh, maybe caring will be also producing data at the same time. So maybe it will be more uh, a kind of hybridation than. Um, um, going from one medicine to another, um, so yeah, that's what I could I could say. Uh. Yes, yeah, if I may jump in, um, I think that um, Carla Danani's and Michele Cardinali's questions are strictly related, so I try to give an an answer that covered both the questions. So starting from um, Carla, are we running towards? a medicine of data? Well, um, unfortunately, I would say that we are already living this kind of medicine every day. So um, I'm not sure that COVID-19 uh, is the cause of this um, run towards a medicine of data. It's a problem that we are experiencing um, a medicine that is mostly quantitative, so based on data. Um, this is not necessarily bad. I mean, uh, it's also what allowed us to have a highly specialized medicine, as I uh, said before. Um, so we have a medicine that is incredibly, incredibly performing. Um, we, we want this, right? So it's not a problem itself. The problem is that we don't have, at least um, maybe we have, we lost um, a broader, the broader image. So. Um, and this is what uh, allowed me to connect to Michele Cardinali's questions, uh, which are the skills that doctors need to communicate properly with patients. And I think in this uh, broader image that medicine needs to uh, recover in some ways, um, there's the answer. Um, I strongly believe in not in an interdisciplinary world, because interdisciplinary still means that 
every field of knowledge is kind of close on itself and then speak to the other one. I, I think more of a multidisciplinary world in which medicine is not just medicine and humanities are not just uh, humanities. And the two, in this case, two or more fields of knowledge are close to in on itself and then speak and relate to uh, one to another. So um, I think that the answer is that um, not only medicine, but since we are talking about medicine, uh, has to um, make a step, I, I would say um, a step backward, but it does mean a, back, a step forward. So um, what I'm trying to say is that this step forward means to uh, bring medicine to another level, that it's not just uh, limited to the quantitative level, but at the same time, it, at the same time, it's a step backward because it allowed medicine to have a, this broader image that is, uh, it's losing due to this highly specialization. Um, so uh, the the, la the very last question of Michele, I'm, I'm not sure I, I totally got it. Um, for what I for what I got of your question, you asked if there's a lot of attention in telemedicine from physicians. You mean um, if there's kind of a price to pay when in telemedicine in the in, in sense of care or, or cure, right? Okay, so um, that's an interesting question because I, I'm personally experiencing that lots of physicians uh, leave telemedicine as a um, watered down compromise. So uh, they think that it's uh, not something, it's not, um, I would say a positive changing, but a bad one. So they think that this is not improving their professional their, um, their professionality and instead it's a way to um, not to take care properly of patients and it's interesting because I think we are <laughs> experiencing here um, a skeptical attitude towards and, and again new technologies in the sense of uh, new in the clinical context but um, I don't think that telemedicine necessarily calls for a loss of attention to our patients. Instead, it could be exactly the opposite. So think about these patients that could not go to the hospital due to economic condition or geographical um, conditions. And, and the physician with telemedicine could reach them. Or think about, as I said in my presentation, uh, the fact that telemedicine is less time consuming. And uh, so, for example, if you just need a follow up and you have to take care of uh, two, three children, you don't have to take a day off uh, work and family to go to the hospital. You just have to switch on your laptop. I, I don't think that this, this is a price to pay from physician, but in sense, something that patient could, uh, um, could experience in a positive way. Um, so yeah, I, I w again, maybe it would be um, more, it would be easier for physicians to understand all of this if they, um, if they are, um, if, if they can make this step backward and forward that I talked about, that I've just talked about. So recover this broader image, right? Not just being focused on data and what means to, um, for, a, for an ill patient to um, defeat his or her disease. But uh, yeah, again, a broader, a broader image. That's what we need, I think. And COVID-19 is just, again, as Enrico said, an opportunity maybe to face this and to focus this just better than before. And thank you for your questions, of course. If I may, I would have a question to, I don't know if you have still to answer, uh, react, if you speakers have reactions to, to the questions. No, I would have a question that, that comes to my mind uh, um, listening to you. 
So, and it is in terms of, because Monica underscore the lack of pragmatics. And, um, and, and, and Alain underscore the, like to say, the validity or the, the powerful uh, dimension that uh, this kind of, uh, the use of this technology can have also. So, like to say, there is an encouragement, as you told us uh, earlier, in, in terms of using this kind of technology. But I am, I wonder about. Uh, the bodily relationship among or between uh, the physician and the patient, uh, the clinicians uh, and the uh, um, people who are in need of care. So there is like, uh, why do I talk of uh, like to say a bodily relationship or I am thinking of uh, the phenomenology of body and I mean or the phenomenology of illness. How much could this kind of interaction? I, I was very impressed by the fact that the French law um, considered the opportunity or suggested the opportunity to um, to have, uh, like to say, to use telemedicine and then to have a more traditional um, medical check. Because I can imagine there is also a form of uh, observation of the body that uh, uh, the clinical eyes can do in, in uh, okay. Uh, we, we say hello to Enrico and we thank Enrico really much for coming. See you soon. Bye. Ciao Enrico, thank you. Grazie, thanks a lot to you. Grazie a te. So I think how much can, the, like, like you said, the direct present, the being there in face of the person, which kind of value can it have, both in clinical terms, but I think also in relational terms and for the healing relationship. Because I think this idea, it's a very ancient idea, this idea of the taumaturgic power of, uh, of healers that is very old, it was attributed to, to the kings in uh, in the French uh, ancient or Middle Age culture, but there is something that still remain also sometimes in traditional healing. This idea that in order to treat and to heal someone, you need something that is a physical contact. And so I, it's very challenging for me, telemedicine, considering this peculiar aspect. It's something that always uh, 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 creates questions to, to me. So I, it's just... Uh, and, and a reflection I, I would like to share, but I would like to, 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 to discuss a little bit or to listen to your opinion about that, because I think it's an open challenge that too. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, as I said in my presentation, I, I cannot agree with uh, a medicine that is only based on telemedicine. So I see telemedicine as an opportunity to reach patients that otherwise wouldn't be um, possible to, to reach and to um, make easier for uh, some patients and some physicians to, or healthcare professionals in general to uh, do their practice in special conditions. Um, maybe also in everyday uh, life, so I'm not talking about just emergency context. Of course, in everyday life, we also experience particular uh, peculiar context in which telemedicine could be helpful. But I'm also thinking about, um, as I said, follow up a very um, quick um, uh, encounter between physicians and patients. So um, yeah, I think about the telemedicine that is confined to these special cases. So I, I, I cannot be um, I cannot agree personally with a, a, a medicine that is only virtual because um, I strongly believe that the in, in present uh, relationship between the physician and the patient or the healthcare workers and patients uh, is is important and has to be the base of the of the relationship. So we don't experience problems or issues just on the communicative level. I think it would be 
the problems will be deeper. So I agree with you when you see it as problematic. Oh, thank you, Lu Lucia. It's a really, really interesting reflection. Um, maybe what I could say is that um, uh, the, uh, I try to avoid to consider um, telemedicine like a, a, an isolate moment and to evaluate it uh, only uh, from from. No, telemedicine is is one act among other which takes place into an organization a spatial one in which takes place also from a temporal uh, view in, into a, a real, um, in French we say parcours, parcours de santé. So um, I totally uh, um, share you, your thoughts. If uh, medicine were reduced to that moment and to a specific moment, then I, I would be totally agree with you and that we, we would really uh, lose something. But it's, if it's one moment, one act, one, one kind of organization, um, healthcare um, uh, with other um, acts, um, it's, it's different, so. Many thanks, both of you. <laughs> it's a way to start sharing. There is a lot of, there are many uh, philosophical reflections, I think that, that could be uh, done and that uh, that need the space and time to uh, to better reflect on the evolutions and the innovation we are living and uh, and, and experimenting. So may I ask? May I ask? Uh, yes, one of thing course. Only uh, to the philosophers, they have to help us because. I, I fear that uh, telemedicine uh, will um, take away from us uh, in the relationship with patients the time of listening, uh, listening to patient, listening to his problems, listening to his fears. Yes, we can do it uh, with telemedicine, but it's another um, uh, way of, of listening. And so, in my opinion, and in our uh, daily life, we see, uh, particularly in this, um, in this last months, that uh, we miss a lot uh, the time of listening with patient, to, to patients. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I've not done uh, ethnographic research, but when I speak with uh, researcher, when I speak with physician, maybe what really surprised me is the fact that uh, telemedicine se seems to be a really structured time, structural time. So um, there is maybe less time for surprises. Um, um, maybe if you go, uh, if you are a physician, you go to, to someone home, someone place, um, there is not only the time of the consultation when you are in the room, there is also before when when you enter, there is also when you, when you get out. A, a physician I work with told me that sometimes a lot of things are said just before um, open the exit door. So it's a kind of middle space, middle time too. So maybe with telemedicine, it's the side effect of a uh, well structured time, uh, well organized time. And maybe it's, it's why sometimes it's, it's shorter because we have to say what we have to say. There is no place for, 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 for the, for a surprise, for, for letting the, maybe uh, it could be interesting to, to see uh, on a ethnographic level if it is true or not, but maybe uh, we are more afraid of um, silence in virtual or video conference than in the real um, in presential uh, conversation. So yeah, uh, I would say that definitively it's it's a new uh, it's, it's a, another structuration of time. And um, but I work with physicians who take that into account because um, for the kind of patients they are they are caring, sometimes telemedicine is the only way to be in contact with them, and so they are conscious of those problems and they try to to find a way to to face uh, a physician told me that 
she wanted to create a virtual waiting room <laughs> to recreate, um, to, to avoid the, the sometimes uh, a bit uh, uh, frightening feeling of being immediately in contact <laughs> with the physician. Because in presence, you, you, you take your car, you go, you are, you are waiting in the waiting room. So you, you can, you can be prepared to meet the physician. So some physician could, could create with technological mediation, uh, new, new rituals. It was the word, um, the physician I work with use new rituals. So, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see that Alain and I are always on the same page here about all of these topics. So, yeah, I completely agree. And I really think that um, the um, most challenging side of telemedicine is that it's a more structured place uh, compared to the in-person. Even if the in-person um, meeting between healthcare professionals and uh, patients is structured, so but it's kind of more spontaneous. So we don't really pay much attention on about it on, on it. Um, yeah, what I personally try to do with the healthcare professionals in, in training in my training courses is together to to structure the, the meeting in telemedicine, so in virtual context. And this really helped them for, for what I could see, um, also in, in pay more attention to both themselves in the virtual place and to patients too, because of course this is uh, so important and, and Marco uh, expressed his fear that um, there's a lack of listening, so this um, uh, yeah, I would say to this praise structure of the, the virtual place would be, could be very helpful for, for both the sides of the uh, relationship. And again, um, as I said before, I think that um, the virtual spaces just bring to the extreme consequences uh, issues that already already exist in the clinical practice. So for example, um, the lack of listening to patients, I think that in the virtual place is just uh, getting worse, but uh, not that is completely new, right? So uh, again, COVID-19 and um, the fact that COVID-19 outbreak forces us to use these technologies, maybe it's the uh, right opportunity to face this uh, problems because we can't really see them right uh, bring brought to their to their extreme consequences so they're more clear they, they are clearer to us we can really point it out which are the problems and try to to, to solve them yes uh, thanks a lot <laughs> sorry i'm <laughs> Thank you, Marco, for, for the questions. And for Marco, actually, is a, is, a, is a physician. So he works in the intensive therapy, uh, intensive care uh, unit for neonatology and, uh, and also in, in palliative care for children. So it's an extremely complicated field. And uh, so I, I think uh, um, no, many thanks to, to you for this. Uh, wonderful presentation. I think you helped us to, to, to have a, a better overview of the situation. Uh, Alain gave us elements to reflect and elements to consider also uh, some deep philosophical issues and some uh, already uh, expressed and, and identified the possible legal solutions. And Monica started with uh, uh, a research that uh, she has uh, uh, driven during the COVID and then she is uh, working uh, also more extensively on these uh, topics. So I thank uh, really all of you. I think there is uh, more to discuss and maybe most of all more to work on and to, to research on. That's also my impression. So uh, we I hope we will have the opportunity to, to meet again and to move on with this kind of confrontation and reflection. I thank uh, 
Alain, Monica, Enrico. Uh, I thank all the participants who joined us and I thank a lot uh, Isabella for her support uh, behind the scenes. So thank you so much. Have a very nice time and uh, take care. Arrivederci. Take care. Bye.